Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSURG, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababella Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Search from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Welcome back everyone. Today we will be having a look at a paper recently published in BJS entitled Low Pressure vs. Standard Pressure Laparoscopic Colorectal Surgery, the PAROS trial. Uh, Professor Sababella Subramanian is then going to talk about uh, p-values and confidence intervals, core essential topics um, for anybody reading or being involved in research. We have a couple of special episodes coming up in uh, June and July, so stay tuned. So hi everyone, I'm Sadia, one of the surgical researchers working at Huddersfield Royal Infirmary, and I'm here with my registrar, Mr. Gio Perrin, and we'll be discussing a paper on low pressure versus standard pressure laparoscopic colorectal surgeries, which is a PARAS trial, and it's a phase three randomized controlled trial. And this was recently published, published in the British Journal of Surgery in March of 2021. And now Gio will take you through the background. Yeah, just a quick word about uh, um, the reasons why this sort of paper was born. Uh, well, we do know that the laparoscopic approach to colon surgery is supported by a fair amount of evidence. Um, this is both in terms of recovery uh, and reduced pain postoperatively. We discuss the implications of this to emergency surgery, and I invite you to have a look at our episode 9 if you're interested. Uh, worth mentioning here, in 2002, the European Association of Endoscopic Surgery recommended to insufflate at the lowest possible pressure that will still provide sufficient exposure to perform your operation. And this is regardless of what operation you're doing, so it's not specific to colorectal surgery or anything in particular. The main advantages of using a lower uh, pressure would be reduced pain uh, and potentially shorter hospital stay. And this supposedly is driven by a reduced stress to your diaphragm, your uh, lungs, and obviously reduced stretch to uh, your abdominal wall. Uh, what we do not know for sure is whether it is equally safe um, or if it is more difficult and if the views are um, equally good. Um, in this particular setting, the air seal, uh, which is uh, a particular type of uh, insufflator to uh, generate your pneumoperitoneum, um, is uh, tested in this particular uh, trial. Um, it's supposed to maintain your pneumoperitoneum more stable uh, and allow a sort of more control smoke evacuation, particularly when you're using energy devices and, and suction. Um, so, ball back to you, Sadia. Thank you. So just discussing the aims of this trial, which was to see what's the impact of low pressure pneumoperitoneum during laparoscopic colectomies. And the patients that were chosen were the ones undergoing elective laparoscopic colectomy. And the intervention was low pressure pneumoperitoneum, which was compared with the standard pressure pneumoperitoneum. And the primary outcome that was assessed was what was the duration of hospital stay in these two arms. And secondary was what was the post-operative pain, um, how much analgesia was consumed by these patients and was there any difference in the post-operative morbidity in the two arms? Back to you, Gio. Yeah, so uh, this was a double-blinded randomized control uh, trial, which was conducted in a single center uh, with six surgeons involved at Bordeaux University Hospital in France uh, between January 2019 and May 2020, so a relatively small uh, time frame for recruitment. Uh, patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to uh, two treatments, either low pressure, uh, 5 to 7 millimeters of mercury, or standard pressure, 12 to 15 millimeters of mercury. Uh, no blocks were used and no minimization was used uh, in uh, uh, this randomization. Uh, this is designed as a superiority trial, uh, and I invite you to have a look at our previous teaching session from last month if you want to know more about this. Um, and the aim is to demonstrate a one day difference in length of stay in favor of a low pressure uh, pneumoperitoneum. Uh, so let's move on. Uh, the included patients uh, were 18 years old or older, uh, not pregnant, and only um, a procedure that started uh, with a laparoscopic or robotic intent uh, was allowed to be included. 
uh, right or left colectomies without a defunctioning stoma with the uh, pretty much only procedures allowed. So no subtotals, no cecectomies uh, or anything else. Uh, only elective procedures were allowed and a variety of malignant and benign pathologies were included. So uh, here we've got um, UC, Crohn's, uh, uh, together with large polyps, together with uh, um, known uh, cancers. Uh, the surgeon was allowed to uh, perform no other procedure uh, apart from the colectomy, with the exception of appendicectomies and liver biopsies that could be performed concomitantly. And Sadia is going to talk us through the timeline of the study. So this is just a small chart which shows the timeline of the surgery. So all the red bits are the primary outcomes and the yellow bits are the secondary outcomes and the patients were randomized into two arms, either in the low pressure pneumoperitoneum, which was 10 millimeter of mercury, or the standard at 12. And this was done a day before the surgery. And the patients that read their surgery, and then they were, the primary outcome was to see with a preset criteria for discharge, that whether if the patients had pain or how much pain they had, and what was the analgesia consumption, if they had any nausea or vomiting, if there were any temperature spikes of more than 38 degrees, or how how quickly they resume their normal diet and mobilization. And second in secondary outcomes, it was assessed that what was their pain score according to VAS, which is the visual analog scale, and what were the analgesic requirements at two, eight, and twenty-four hours. And this was according to the ERAS protocol. And these patients were followed up for a month after post-operatively. Back to you, Gio. So, uh, as you can see from the flow chart, 151 patients were assessed for eligibility and 138 were ultimately randomized. Um, 69 were allocated to low pressure and uh, 69 to standard pressure, as you would expect in a one-to-one -one fashion. Um, 58 in the low pressure received their allocated intervention and worth noting here, nine uh, of them were converted to a standard pressure uh, as visibility was not good enough. They had two conversions to open surgery in either group. Um, as you can see, we have a few exclusions after randomizations, and most of them uh, for patients that were wrongly included because the wrong procedure was picked up, either a total colectomy or an appendicectomy, as you can see uh, from the chart. Some of them could have potentially been prevented. Um, so 62 ultimately ended up being in the low pressure and 65 in the standard pressure. None of them were lost to follow up, but again, follow up here is uh, only 30 days. Uh, so ball back to you, Sadia. Just talking about the results, they analyzed uh, 127 patients and what they saw was that in group A, which was the low pressure group, the mean hospital stay was three days compared to four in the other group, and which was quite significant. And then the secondary outcome, which was assessed, was the pain score. And what they saw was that initially in the first two hours postoperatively, group A, which was the low pressure group, complained of less pain as compared to the ones in the other group. And if, as we can see in this table, at two hours, 76% of the patients in group A complained of less pain as compared to 59% of the patients, which was a significant finding. And then again, at eight hours reassessed, 87% of the patients were still complaining of pain scores of three. And in group B, there were 72% of the patients, which was also a significant finding. But at 24 hours, what they noted was it was almost the same amount of patients complaining of pain, so it lost its significance th there. And this is just a graph depicting what we've already spoken about, um, in which the blue line depicts the low pr pressure group and the red line depicts the, the standard pressure group. And um, as you can see, 76% versus 59% of the patients complained of less pain at two hours and then eight hours, it was still significant, but by the time it was almost a day postoperatively, it was almost the same. Did you? Yeah, so just a quick glance at their uh, surgical results. Um, so as you can see, surgical morbidity was comparable uh, between the two groups, so six out of 62, 11 out of 65 patients uh, with no statistically significant difference. Um, and as you can see, leak rate was, well, I would say that there is a tendency towards it being slightly higher in the standard pressure group. However, 
uh, there's no statistically significant difference throughout the board uh, in total. Uh, if you look at medical morbidity, uh, that is again comparable. Uh, and finally, looking at Clavian uh, uh, Dindo um, complications, as you can see, grade two complications were tendentially more common in the control um, arm. Um, however, uh, no significant really difference uh, looking at uh, the table itself. Uh, ball back to you, Sadia. So just talking about some of the limitations that was reported by the study itself, uh, they realized that it, there was poor exposure with low pressure in some of the patients, so they had to increase the pressure back to standard pressure in nine of the patients. 3% um, of the patients had to undergo a laparotomy in both groups, and that was either because they were unable to resect the tumor or because of the body habitus. And they also noted that the benefit of low pressure in, on post-operative pain was lost after the first 24 hours. And Joe will take you through the other limitations. Yeah, just a few words about other few points that we picked up reading uh, through the paper. Um, now, concerning the primary outcome, which is, as we mentioned, length of stay, uh, we definitely uh, mentioned that there is a difference between the two groups in favour of the low pressure. Um, however, it's worth mentioning that the range between the two groups is quite different. It's um, 2 to 13 in the uh, low pressure group and uh, 2 to 42 in the standard pressure group. Um, now, Prof will correct me if I'm wrong here, but when you are performing your sample size calculations and you are aiming to detect a certain difference between the two groups, you are also assuming that the variance between the two groups is similar. Um, and I could not find any other measures of uh, variations uh, of um, within the groups uh, in the paper, but the range that I just mentioned. So um, it might be interesting to just know that as well. Um, I'm not entirely sure where the decision to use a wind day difference uh, to make the sample size calculations comes from. Uh, all the literature available, um, or the vast majority of it, comes from laparoscopic cholecystectomies, really, uh, or uh, um, gynecological surgery. Uh, and uh, the um, sort of expected uh, difference in length of stay that comes from those papers is a fraction of a day, uh, around a quarter of a day. Um, so I'm not entirely sure why they chose one day and how previous literature informed their sample size calculation. But again, this is picking a little bit. Um, they use no blocks and no minimization to perform the randomization. Um, I'm not entirely sure how externally valid uh, this can be, so how applicable it would be in a different reality, in a lower volume center, for example, or where sort of um, the anesthetic and analgesic protocols are not uh, as well standardized. And finally, this is just the thought. Um, obviously, this study is uh, designed um, and powered to detect a difference in length of stay. Um, However, we are talking about procedures with a certain degree of mortality, uh, about 2%, and a certain degree of, um, of anastomotic leaks, which uh, does obviously add a, a significant morbidity. So um, I was pondering if I were the authors whether I would choose to first of all demonstrate non-inferiority of a low pressure versus standard pressure in terms of safety. So choosing a primary outcome, that's a complication. Uh, ball back to you, Sadia, for uh, some conclusions. Right, so to conclude, um, low pressure neoperitoneum in colonic resections improve post-operative recovery in shortening the duration of stay in the hospital. And then we just have a little table which showing some pros and cons of the study. And thank you for joining us today, everyone. As usual, a quick rundown of what we discussed after the presentation. First of all, um, with the help of Professor Barosubramanian, uh, we clarified a couple of points. Uh, yes, um, variance uh, is definitely important uh, when looking at um, any variables. However, in this context, it is given the non-parametric nature of um, length of stay as a, a parameter, expected to uh, have a certain variability uh, of range. So uh, this is uh, probably in line uh, with uh, normal and should not affect the validity of the study findings. Concerning the sample size calculations, yes this is generally informed by previous literature uh, 
Um, however, uh, it is uh, more than adequate for the authors to decide what threshold they would accept, particularly in terms of superiority, when adopting a new treatment strategy such as the low pressure pneumoperitoneum. So the one day uh, as a number um, is adequate, obviously as chosen by the authors. Concerning the nature of this study being a superiority trial, uh, we had some discussion concerning uh, the possibility of adopting a different approach, such as uh, looking at non-inferiority of the uh, low pneumoperitoneum pressure versus standard pressure using a complication as a primary outcome indicator rather than length of stay. And uh, given the relatively poor evidence predating uh, this trial, uh, it would be reasonable to take that approach rather than a superiority approach. Furthermore, we discussed the um, possibility of assessing the success of uh, the blinding. Authors are uh, very meticulous in the double blinding technique. It is quite uh, clear that uh, patients were blinded to the intervention as well as um, assessors and that the primary surgeon involved could not uh, be uh, discussing um, discharge dates with the patient. However, we highlighted how some of the discharge criteria uh, laid down in study protocol could be open to interpretation and we would wonder if the persons making the decisions concerning the discharge of the patient uh, were actually unaware of the uh, arm that the patients were on, whether that could have influenced um, their discharge decisions. So assessing for success of blinding in this context uh, could have been interesting. Finally, we mentioned the importance of um, social and cultural biases uh, in terms of um, discharging patients, the support network that those patients uh, go back to. The discharge destination for these patients would be a probably a relevant um, factor to take into account. A final point would be the importance of the learning curve associated with uh, learning a correct or a section uh, in a lower pressure settings. How feasible it would be to maintain this low pressure practice uh, in the context of a teaching setting. All right, I'll leave you to the presentation now. Thank you. So, so that's what we're going to be talking about today, p-values and confidence intervals. Right, just to uh, recap, I'm not a statistician. I don't have any formal qualifications. But I think these are um, concepts that uh, anyone who is involved in clinical research or any research should understand. And hopefully this will help some of you who are on your uh, way to doing research and critiquing papers. OK, let's consider an example. So let's assume that you're doing a study and a cohort study of patients undergoing major abdominal surgery and you're looking at risk factors for infection. So that's a topic let's assume you're interested in. And one of the factors you're looking at is smoking. And let's say that you've got some data on smokers and non-smokers. And because this is a cohort study, you have a lot more non-smokers than smokers, right? So this is not a case control study. So you're starting off with risk factors and then you're following patients up to see if they've had infection or not. And let's assume that these are the numbers that you've got. Uh, so you've got 600 non-smokers, 50 smokers, and you've looked at infection rates in these two groups. And you find that among smokers, 60% have had an infection. However, you've defined an infection and 20%, uh, so a much a smaller proportion of non-smokers have had infection. Right. So there's a clear difference in infection rates. So you've got 60% versus 20%. And then you uh, have to ask yourself the question, what does this difference mean? What does this threefold difference in infection rates mean? Is this the truth? Can you generalize this to the wider popul population of patients undergoing major abdominal surgery? Or could this be that this is just a chance finding? In this one study, you found a threefold difference. Right. So what would happen if you repeat the study, if you did the study another time or third time, fourth time up to a dozen times? Now, obviously, because these things are not fixed in stone um, and, and uh, nature is variable, 
uh, clinical outcomes are variable, you could get a lot of different results. You could do another study and find a result and that shows um, that gives you rates of 50 and 30 percent or you could do a study that gives you fairly equal infection rates and so on and so forth, right? So how do we get to the true rates without repeating the study a thousand times or without having to study the entire population of patients undergoing major abdominal surgery in a region? We've got to accept that we can never really get to the true rates. You do a study in your institute, you will find rates that are probably slightly or sometimes very different to what's reported in, in, in this particular study, right? All we can do is we can rely on estimates and probabilities. Okay, so with that in mind, and assuming that this study was well designed and the cohort is generalizable, can you then say, oh, we can rely on this estimate of 20 and 60 percent, uh, which is a threefold difference. And can we state that smokers are three times more likely to get postoperative infection? Can we do that with confidence? That's the question. In other words, are these results significant? So you've got the rates, but then you've got to decide on whether they are significant. So when we talk about significance, I think it's quite useful to just have a little um, think about the difference between what we call clinical significance and what is meant by statistical significance. So as you can see in this in this table, clinical significance um, answers a question um, whether this difference that you see is of clinical importance or clinical relevance. Whilst in statistical significance, you're looking to see if the difference is likely to be true or real. Right. And clinical significance is based on your judgment as a clinician, your knowledge, value, experience and, and wisdom. So you decide what is clinically important um, for you to recognize as, as something positive and, and then to imply the result, the, the uh, and then to um, accept the results and incorporate them in your practice. But a statistical significance has to be based on statistical testing. And statistical methods, right? So you might say that, right, we've seen a 40% increase uh, in infection rates in smokers, which is a threefold increase. But um, the question is, how do we know this is real? Uh, to which a clinician might say, well, the study is really well done, seems to be free of bias, so it's internally valid, it's generalizable. This is the population I see in my practice. So, so what's the problem? Um, I'm quite happy with this significant, with what I consider to be a clinically significant difference in infection rates. To which a methodologist or a statistician might say that this difference that you see could still be due to chance. And therefore, we need to understand the probability that this difference occurred just due to random chance. In other words, he or she is saying that you need to be doing statistical testing. To ensure that this is not due to chance. So before you start um, contemplating a statistical test or before you do statistical testing, you need to think about the hypothesis. So the hypothesis here is fairly straightforward. Uh, when I say hypothesis here, I mean the null hypothesis. And, and that would be that there is no difference in infection rates between smokers and non-smokers, right? So that'll be the null hypothesis. And I've got the table here again with the numbers that we've just discussed and um, just so you can recollect the numbers and then um, and take it from me that the statistical test for significance in uh, with data of this kind which is categorical data is um, done using a method called the chi-square test right we're not going to go into the details of chi-square testing here but that's the test we would do so um, in the olden days, we used to calculate the chi-square statistic, use degrees of freedom, and then figure out the probability of getting um, at least this chi-square value or more than this chi-square value from either a table or a calculator. But these days, you can run a chi-square status uh, test really quickly using an online software like SPSS. Okay, so let's uh, assume that you've done this chi-square test. And the um, calculator gives you these values. It says that the chi-square statistic is 41.6, degree of freedom is 1, and the p-value that you get as a result of doing the statistical test 
is less than 0 0.01. It is actually um, less than 0 0.0001 in this particular calculation, but, but that's okay. So, so it's very, very low. So what does that p-value mean? So the p-value here means that it refers to the probability of getting a result at least as extreme as this due to chance alone. So in other words, the probability of getting a result like this or um, a greater difference than this is extremely low, right? On that basis, where you have a p-value that is extremely low, which is you know much less than one in hundred or less than 0 0.05, we have to say that if the null hypothesis is true, then this result is extremely unlikely to have occurred. Okay, which means because the p-value is extremely low, we're going to reject the null hypothesis and thereby implicitly we say, oh, we will accept the alternative hypothesis, which um, uh, is that smoking and infection are associated. Okay, so I hope that explains the meaning of the p-value. Now, the value of 0 0.05 is arbitrary. It's just a convention that you say that um, uh, if the chances of observing the result as extreme as this is less than 1 in 20, we'll be happy to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, some people um, don't like this arbitrary value and would like to go down even further to 0 0.01, uh, but, but that's fine. You've got to um, a priori before the start of the study decide what p-value you would accept as your uh, cutoff or, or your threshold. Right. So um, some of you might have uh, listened to the talk on type 1 and type 2 errors, and the point to note here is that the p-value is essentially uh, the same conceptually as a type 1 error, which is the probability of falsely rejecting the null hypothesis. Okay, and keep in mind that p-value is simply not the probability that the null hypothesis is true. Um, when you start off a study or a, a statistical test to test the null hypothesis, uh, you've got to keep in mind that you can never prove the null hypothesis. You can only gather enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. And if you reject the null hypothesis, then you have to, um, then that means that uh, you're accepting uh, the alternative hypothesis. Other point to note is that the p-value does not reflect effect size or the strength of the association. So um, if you get a relative risk of say six or eight or 10, that doesn't mean that your p-value will get smaller and smaller. Um, and then the converse is true as well. And finally, you just have to keep in mind that the p-value on its own is not sufficient uh, to judge a, a model. So you need something else, and that's what we're going to go on to next. If you did want to uh, read up a little bit more about p-values, there's a really good article um, on the internet, free to access from the American Statistical Society uh, Association on p-values, and the link is here. Right. So the other concept we're going to discuss today is um, confidence intervals. So let's keep the example we've discussed in mind again. We found that infection appears to increase risk of, um, sorry, smoking appears to increase infection risk threefold. In other words, the relative risk is three, and we've got a really low p-value, okay? Now this relative risk of three is one estimate, or a point estimate, but we're not, clear yet as to how precise this estimate is. Or in other words, what's the range of the interval in which most values uh, are likely to lie? If you do 10, 15 studies, what's the likelihood that you're going to get um, values that are around uh, the point estimate of three? And when I say most, in statistical terms, in statistical parlance, we refer to 95%. Uh, Okay, so what's the range of interval in which 95% of the values are likely to lie? Is the question. Now, it could it be 2.9 to 3.1? That'll be fairly close, narrow range. Or could it be as wide as 0 0.5 to 10? That'll be a, a very wide range. Okay, and this range or interval is what we refer to as the confidence interval. Uh, 
we often see confidence intervals being de depicted or described in forest plots, which are part of systematic reviews and meta-analysis. And you would have come across plots like these, where um, the squares in blue refer to point estimates from individual studies, and the lines around these point estimates are the 95% confidence intervals of that effect size um, uh, in that particular study. So in this particular forest plot, you've got four different studies with point estimates and confidence intervals. Okay, so I've done some calculations for this particular example, and I found that the 95% confidence interval for this particular um, relative risk of three in this study was between 2.3 to 4. Now, the precise calculations are tricky, they're, they're beyond the scope of this lecture, but um, we're fortunate that there are lots of software and online calculators that you can use to get confidence intervals for a variety of point estimates. So, going back to um, both p-values and confidence intervals, let's compare them. So, p-values um, enable a rapid assessment of significance. If somebody's got a p-value for you, you look at it and you know um, straight away whether it's a significant result or not. While a confidence interval gives you a range within which the real value may lie. Okay, so it also provides you um, strength of the association. So you know how, how likely the, um, uh, the association is going to be and how strong it's going to be. And it tells you the direction of effect. So if it's a relative risk of more than one, you know that smoking increases risk of infection. If it's a relative risk of less than 1, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, then you know that smoking uh, may be associated with less infection. Okay, so the confidence interval gives you uh, both strength and direction of uh, the effect. Right, a couple of little points to note. So when someone says 95% confidence interval, it does not mean that the interval is 95% likely to contain the effect size. Uh, we'll never know what the truth out there in the population is going to be. So what the 95% confidence interval um, refers to is the likelihood that if you do 100 other studies, 95% um, of them will give you a point estimate that will lie within this interval. So that's what the true meaning of confidence interval is. Okay. And when you're writing a report, when you're looking at studies, it's, it's ideal, it's encouraged by lots of journals, lots of editors to, that uh, you describe both the p-values and 95% confidence intervals for any um, uh, statistical uh, method uh, you can use. Okay. Now, the final point really is that these values, the confidence intervals and the p-values, uh, depend on a number of factors and in particular sample sizes. So let's just take the same example again. You've got smokers versus non-smokers compared to uh, infection as an outcome. And you know that we had 650 patients to start off with in the study. And uh, let, let's just assume somebody else has done a really small study, but very similar in design uh, and uh, assumptions. So, and these numbers in red are from another much smaller study, but very similar in design and assumptions, okay? And you find that the infection rates in both groups are fairly similar. It's just that the numbers are really low. So if you then compare the parameters in the larger study and the smaller study, what you will see is that the relative risk is the same because these studies are very uh, identical in design, but the p-values in 95% confidence intervals suggests that the strength of evidence is not, not that high in the smaller study. So in other words, p-values and 95% confidence intervals de depend a lot on sample sizes. Okay, so I hope that made sense. So to summarize, p-value is simply the probability that the observed value, or a more extreme one, is due to chance. So it is the same conceptually as a type 1 error. Conference intervals, or so 95% conference intervals, refer to the interval or the range of values within which observed values from 95% of uh, similar studies uh, from a given population would lie. And p-values and CIs should uh, both be reported uh, when you're doing um, a, 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 an analysis. Okay, that's it from me.
Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.